So I will always associate uh, the poem of ecstasy with getting covered in another person's uh, spit. Hey there, vinyl community. Everyone keeps asking me to do more classical music content, so I figured today I would do sort of a, a, a 10 record or a gimme 10 video. And these are gonna be 10 records of my favorite orchestral pieces that I have ever played. Um, so not my favorite orchestral pieces, period, not my favorite orchestral recordings. Um, recordings of the, my favorite orchestral pieces that I have personally played before. I think every, I'm going to start it off with a bang, I think every classical musician remembers their first Mahler symphony. Uh, the first Mahler symphony that I ever played was symphony number no. one, which is more or less the easiest one to put together, the easiest one to do. Um, and Mahler one is not my favorite. Um, I definitely have a ranking of the Mahler symphonies in my head that maybe I'll do another time, but of all the Mahler symphonies that I've played, which is one, two, uh, six, seven, and nine, uh, I think my favorite is seven. And so I picked Georg Schulte's recording of Mahler Symphony Number no. 7 with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. This is on London Decca. Um, it is a British pressed London recording. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Probably my favorite recording of the piece. Um, there's a few orchestra conductor composer pairings that work really well. And uh, Schulte's Mahler stuff with Chicago is top notch. Also, his London stuff is really good, too, but the stuff with Chicago, I mean, that brass section was made to play Mahler. And of all the Schulte Mahler recordings, um, I think this one, number seven with Chicago, along with number eight, is, is his best work of that repertoire. Um, the only downside, so, uh, like I've said before in many videos, these British Press London releases are sonically the same is the uh, the Decca, the British Decca releases, they're just much cheaper to acquire. However, um, the sad part about the box sets like this, like this is a two record box set, is that the for the US releases, they were auto coupled. Well, what does that mean? It means on side one of this record, so we got side one here, and then the next side on the back uh, is side four. They were made for record you know, record changers, stacked record changers, um, unfortunately. So that's the one pain about listening to this box set is after side one's done, I have to actually put a different record on and go to side two on another, on another record. But uh, it's a thrilling recording. It's, you know, uh, Herseth, principal trumpet of Chicago, sounds fantastic. Um, I played this symphony about, I want to say, five years ago. Um, and it was one of the most thrilling experiences I think I've ever had. I played English horn on it. And it's a very, very juicy English horn part, uh, along with a very juicy oboe part. Um, pretty much all the, the winds get really, really beautiful, extended, flowing solos and chamber moments. Um, the one thing I really appreciate about Mahler um, is that even though his music can be so bombastic and so aggressive and loud and brassy, there's so many... Um, contrasting moments of, of uh, delicacy and um, chamber music interplay between the instruments. Um, he really knew how to write almost music at every emotional level, if that makes sense. The next recording I picked is another London Decca. This is a um, London Blueback. This is Ernst Ansermé in Orchestra Swiss Romain conducting Debussy's Images. Stravinsky's Symphony for Wind Instruments, and Ravel's Pavan for a Dead Princess. Now, um, I have never played the images in full. Uh, I have played the Symphony for Wind Instruments, and I have played Pavan for a Dead Princess. The Symphony for Wind Instruments, however, is the reason I picked this recording. Uh, I played this, again, I think about four, five, six years ago. Um, I did this in my undergrad at MSM, and... Um, at the Manhattan School of Music, there is really no wind ensemble, at least there wasn't when I was there. 
Um, it's purely, if you're in ensembles, you're in orchestra. Um, it's not like some college music programs, some state school music programs where you'll have like a symphonic band and many different wind ensembles. It really is focused on orchestral playing. Um, but every once in a while, um, Mark Gould, who was, was head of the brass department at that time, um, who I don't think is there anymore. Um, he was pr the principal trumpet of the Metropolitan Opera, and he's one of the most interesting and uh, biggest personalities in music I think you'll ever run across. Um, go watch his videos on his YouTube channel. They're hilarious. Um, but any, every once in a while, he would get the winds and the brass together and do a concert of uh, wind repertoire. And it would either be this, it would either be like super, super classic, high level artistry stuff like, um, you know, Stravinsky's Symphony for Wind Instruments, um, like transcriptions of Wagner repertoire, things like that. Or it would be like the most out there zany shit like Frank Zappa, or um, I remember I did this one piece with him for four flutes, four oboes, four trombones, uh, drum set solo and electronic sound manipulation. Um, that was a weird one. I wish I still had the recording from that. So yeah, uh, I have very fond memories of, of the few times I did wind ensemble in my undergrad there. And um, yeah, I remember putting together this symphony for wind instruments and it is devilishly difficult, um, but it's very rewarding. It's beautiful and uh, very intricate music. I played a lot of Stravinsky. Uh, I played some of his choral music. I've played all three of his big ballets. I played the Rite of Spring. I played the full ballet of the Firebird in addition to the Suite, and I played the full ballet of Petrushka. Um, those are all difficult, but they're not. Um, they're not. Uh, Firebird's pretty difficult. Uh, Petrushka is not that bad. Uh, the Rite of Spring is not that bad. Uh, however, I think this Symphony for Wind Instruments is probably the most difficult Stravinsky I've ever played. Um, it was very nerve-wracking to play, um, especially in, in the, the high-level group that I was playing it with at the time when I was probably like, I think, 21, 22. Um, but if you've never listened to later period Stravinsky, Stravinsky changed um, throughout his life. His, his compositional style changed drastically. You know, he started off with his ballets when he was very young, you know, the Rite of Spring, the Firebird, Petrushka, that were very much in a, in a uh, modernist Russian style. Um, that's what's called his Russian period. However, he went through a number of compositional periods, including a uh, serialist period and a, uh, and a neoclassical period. And the Symphony for Wind Instruments kind of sits, I would say stylistically, in the middle of his... his um, you know, serial and neoclassical. There's elements of, of both styles in this. It's um, a little bit abstract, but it's very, I would say tonal. I think it's kind of tonal and it's uh, very like stacking harmonies. Um, it's very difficult music to get just right. It's more delicate than I think um, some of his earlier music. And because it's not bombastic the way the Rite of Spring is, I think sometimes his later music gets overlooked, which is a shame because um, I think he, it's brilliant and I don't think he's ever written music that isn't brilliant. Um, he's truly in a, uh, I guess we can call him an American giant. I guess we get to claim him as an American. He spent pretty much all his late career here. I really like the music of Jean Sibelius. I don't know many people that don't like Sibelius, but um, out of all Sibelius's music, I think by far his best composition is his Symphony No. 2. And here I have a uh, wonderful recording with Eugene Ormandy and the Philadelphia Orchestra um, playing Symphony No. 2 in D major. I think this is a 6i. You know, I forgot to check when I got this out. Yes, this is an original Columbia Stereo 6i pressing. Um, which do sound a little bit better than the later 2i versions. Um, they're a little bit more um, full sounding. Uh, this, what, when did I play this? I played this, I think this was my first concert of my master's degree at McGill University. Um, I had just moved to Montreal and um, it was my first time playing with the McGill Symphony. I was playing principal and um, it was very, very nerve wracking because I was, I was in a completely new environment in a new city, in a new country, at a new school with, in an orchestra full of people I didn't know. Um, and the beginning moments of this symphony are um, rhythmically a little off-center. They don't, they don't sound, they don't play the way they sound. Um, it's written 
a little bit differently. It's written in like a um, like a syncopation almost. So it's very nerve wracking. The the first like flute and oboe notes uh, in unison together. Um, so I, I remember this symphony pretty vividly, and it's still, I think, my favorite Sibelius symphony to listen to. I hope I get to play it again soon. I think a composer that isn't really talked about enough and isn't played enough is um, Scriabin. Um, Scriabin, I like, I, I've often heard Scriabin be referred to as the Russian Debussy, and I think that fits. He was a Russian composer, but there's a lot of impressionist tendencies in his music, and his music is very dense. He was a um, brilliant pianist, and a lot of his, his orchestration is reflected in his piano playing skills, and so some of it's quite difficult. Um, this is a wonderful recording uh, with Claudio Abbado in the Boston Symphony playing uh, the Poem of Ecstasy along with Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet Suite. And Poem of Ecstasy is such a uh, dense symphony. It's a tone poem, uh, similar to like Liszt or Strauss tone poems. It's one continuous movement and it tells a story. And the Poem of Ecstasy is, um, it starts off, it's, it reminds me a little bit of Death and Transfiguration by Strauss. Um, there's some very delicate woodwind stuff in, in um, the opening that I remember being very stressful. <laughs> And, um, and then it, the, it just kind of snowballs into a uh, kind of furious and um, ecstatic uh, kind of uh, bacchanal, one would say. I mean, this is kind of um, sex, the musical, basically, the poem of ecstasy, more or less. Um, I remember this vividly because not only was it very difficult to play, I played this again about, I think, five years ago. Um, not only was it very difficult to play, but I remember the flute player sitting next to me, I played this at a summer music festival. The flute player sitting next to me, at that time, um, he had a, a flute technique. Well, the flute part in Poem of Ecstasy is very high, very difficult. So I, I, I'm not knocking the, the difficulty of, of kind of powering through uh, the technique required to play this at a, kind of a very, very high pitch. The, the flute part sits up there. But um, he had a problem of uh, basically projectile spitting while he played. And so here I was trying to play this uh, fiendishly difficult oboe part. And the flute player sitting next to me was spitting all over my arm. And so I'm sitting there trying not to flub my runs and runs of 16th notes thinking, Oh God, this is gross. Oh God, this is gross. <laughs> um, so I will always associate... Uh, the poem of ecstasy with getting covered in another person's uh, spit. And um, yeah, especially in the times of COVID, especially gross. Despite that, I still really like this piece. There aren't that many great recordings of this out there, at least from the LP era. I really like this Abato recording with Boston. Um, there's also a very, very good Zubin Mehta recording with Los Angeles that I just, I don't have on hand right now. Um, both excellent. It's a, it's, a, it's a piece worth exploring, I think. Speaking of tone poems, I have a wonderful, speak of the devil, Zubin Mehta recording here. It's Zubin Mehta in Los Angeles, Philharmonic Orchestra playing uh, Richard Strauss's Alpine Symphony. Uh, this is probably my favorite Strauss tone poem. I've played I think all the Strauss tone poems, except for Don Quixote. I haven't played Don Quixote yet, but I've played Don Juan. I've played Death and Transfiguration. I uh, played Heldenleben. Um, I played also Sprach Zarathustra. So yeah, it's um, uh, there's a lot of good Strauss music out there. I think this is my favorite. It's kind of the most um, cerebral Strauss tone poem. It's definitely, I think it's very epic. Um, it reminds me a lot of the music of Mahler. Um, I remember this vividly, and I had a ton of fun playing this, because this is the first and only time that I have ever played the bass oboe. Um, if you don't know what a bass oboe is, Google it. Uh, technically, the part is written for the hecophone. Um, again, if you don't know what a hecophone is, it's not a... I can't explain it very well. But um, essentially, they're instruments that are very similar. Um, the hecophone was designed by a bassoon maker and the bass oboe is usually made by oboe makers. They sit in the same pitch and they play the same role. Um, the hecophone's fingerings are a little different while the bass oboe's fingerings are almost identical to oboe fingerings. 
Um, the problem is it's there's like no heckle phones in the world. There's like three in North America. Um, there's more bass oboes. So usually if there's a heckle phone part, unless you're playing in the New York Phil, they're gonna get you a bass oboe. So yes, the only time I've ever played bass oboe was on uh, Strauss's Alpine Symphony, and it's 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 really fun. Um, you know, you get to really honk out the low notes. It is my opinion that uh, Sergei Prokofiev never wrote any bad music. Almost every Prokofiev work I've ever played has been enjoyable to play. It's been enjoyable to listen to, and it's usually pretty difficult. Um, I think the exception maybe is is his Romeo and Juliet ballet. That one is is actually quite playable for at least on oboe. Um, but his symphonies are usually very tricky. Um, I've played Symphony Number no. One and Symphony Number no. Five, which are the most played, and by far my favorite is Symphony Number no. Five in B flat major. So this is a uh, Mercury Live in Presence recording of Antal Dorati in the Minneapolis Symphony. This is not an original. This is on Speaker's Corner. Um, it sounds outstanding. I've heard an original, and it also sounds quite good. I mean, the original Mercuries are great and. I think the speaker's corner reissues are excellent too, especially since it's easier to find the clean speaker's corner represses. Uh, there's just so much in the symphony that makes uh, Prokofiev. There's there's a Russian character to it. There's even jazzy character. I mean, the second movement is a ton of fun. Um, there there's there's a lot in this symphony, and I remember um, this was another this was another piece. I did in my undergrad, and I think I did it with Mark Gould, actually. And, um, you know, this is someone who's played this piece probably dozens and dozens of times, and he uh, gave us no mercy um, when he was going through it with us. Uh, it, is, it is quite difficult. There's some um, really uh, fiendish low oboe stuff, especially if you're playing second oboe. But yeah, if, if you have heard the music of Prokofiev before and haven't bothered to listen to Symphony No. 5, I think it's by far his, his best work. At least, if we're talking not concertos, because I know pianists, you know, go crazy for the second and third piano concerto, but I think Symphony Number no. Five is where it's at. And if you have a recording like this, with you know, in the 1960s, um, conductors were were a little less afraid to uh, give it the beam, so to speak, and the orchestra was a little less afraid to really go for it. So, um, some of the playing on this Minneapolis recording is almost uh, violent. Uh, and it's the kind of thing you just don't hear anymore. And it's quite fun, I think, uh, on this piece. Uh, it's really one of my favorite recordings. So I know this is, this is uh, supposed to be orchestral pieces, but I couldn't help include something from opera on here because I presented it in an orchestral concert, and that is uh, Wagner's Gotterdammerung. So obviously, Gotterdammerung is the final opera in Wagner's Ring Cycle. And uh, I've never played a full Wagner opera. However, I have played big chunks of a few of them. I have played a uh, good, I, I think I played a full two acts of um, Die Valkyrie with um, Christina Gerke, actually, um, and Alan Held. Uh, this was in Miami, I want to say about four or five years ago, four years ago. And uh, at the end of the concert, we played the final uh, Brunhilde's Immolation um, at the end, at the second act of uh, Goddardemmerung. And... Um, it's incredibly difficult. Um, I think one of the most difficult things about playing this late era Wagner music is that the key basically changes every three bars. Um, it's incredibly difficult in your fingers. Um, it's very chromatic. Uh, so in the performance, we were doing this as kind of a semi-staged production. So uh, we are doing this at the uh, New World Symphony Center in Miami, Florida. And they had a huge light show going on while, um, while the opera singers were singing and we were playing this and this was the final piece in the program. And they turned down the lights and they had the show and we had stand lights and they were all hooked up together. We had all these stand lights so we could actually see our music because the concert hall was very, very, very dark. And in the middle of playing this, which is very, very difficult music, all our stand lights went out. All of them. And... Uh, that was one of the more terrifying concert experiences I've ever had. So you just see, I think the video is up actually on YouTube somewhere. You can see all the, all the players in the orchestra, um, the minute that happens, they just kind of like, they take their instruments and they go into their stand and they go, like trying to squint into their music um, because this is not exactly uh, something you, you memorize. 
Uh, we got through it somehow. I don't know if it sounded as great as it should have, but uh, yeah. So all my memories of playing Wagner, it's really, really hard, but uh, very enjoyable. And it's, you know, um, this music is held in high regard for a reason. It, it's gorgeous, um, dramatic, emotional. Um, say what you will about Wagner the person, but especially God or Damn Wrong is just um, art you cannot argue with. So, next on the list. Um, there's kind of a theme in a lot of these, uh, really, really hard music, because, you know, I played plenty of Mozart symphonies, I played plenty of Haydn symphonies, I played my share of Beethoven symphonies, and um, they're all great, it's all great music, but um, some of this, like, late romantic stuff is, is generally more challenging for the woodwinds, and I find that, you know, rising to a challenge to play really difficult but really uh, rewarding music is always something that kind of leaves bigger memories in me. And also, like, all the big orchestral stuff, you know, you tend to spend more time rehearsing it, you tend to spend more time, um, you know, fretting about it, and, and the concerts are, you know, more well attended. So this is the kind of music that generally sticks in your brain as an orchestral musician, and you have a lot of um, memorable moments with. Um, but a lot of it's generally music that you spent a lot of time practicing um, because it is truly intimidating. And probably, I think, the most intimidating piece I've ever played is uh, Bella Bartok's Miraculous Mandarin Suite. This, uh, probably the most difficult thing I've ever played. Um, and uh, I played this a little over a year ago. Um, we did this at Aspen uh, in the summer. And uh, it was intimidating for a couple of reasons. One, um, Michael Stern was conducting of the Kansas City Symphony, um, brilliant conductor. Uh, the person sitting next to me on first oboe was Alex Klein, former principal oboe of the Chicago Symphony. Um, so I could not, you know, I was not faking. I had to really, really play this well um, and played at breakneck speed next to an oboist that is known for uh, technical wizardry. Um, so I, I really spent a lot of time on this, and it's such a fun piece. I mean, it really is wild, especially when it gets going in the dirge at the end. Um, so this is a tone poem. Miraculous Mandarin is a tone poem. Um, and if you don't know the story behind it, it's actually, I think it was originally Bartok wrote it for a ballet, but it's usually just presented in concert now. Um, and the story is kind of wild. It's about uh, a bunch of prostitutes trying to murder people for money, and, and they try to rob a wealthy Chinese man, and he takes on mystical powers. It's, it's really a strange story um, that's definitely not, uh, not uh, for all audiences. But um, the music is, is uh, some of the most aggressive music Bartok ever wrote, I think. And, it, and the, there's just so much going on in all the parts. Um, you know, some of the runs the woodwinds are doing are just, are just insane out of this world. It's kind of like uh, playing it definitely gave me the feeling of, of holding on for dear life, you know, strapping yourself in and, and you know, hoping nothing goes wrong. Um, so yes, I, I had so much fun playing this music, and it's, and it's really great music, and this, this is a wonderful um, 70s Schulte recording with the London Symphony Orchestra, also again on London Decca, great sound quality, um, if you get the British press versions. Um, and also, the music for strings, percussion, and celeste is on here too, and it's, that's another wonderful Bartok piece. Um, I think Bartok is another composer like Prokofiev that just tended not to write bad music. Now, uh, going to something a little gentler. Um, another piece that I played at McGill um, was Tchaikovsky's Symphony Number no. 5. Um, and I've played now, every, I've played Tchaikovsky 4, 5, and 6, and I've also played a few of his ballets. And I think of all that Tchaikovsky that I've played, I think my favorite is Symphony Number no. 5. I think it's his best symphony. Um, an argument could be made for the Manfred Symphony, at least, but um, of his numbered symphonies, I think number five is, is his best work. Um, it's definitely, I think it's his most melodic in, in some ex to some extent, because, you know, symphony number four is great, but sometimes the melodies just kind of go on and on, um, and symphony number six, it, sometimes I enjoy symphony number six, and sometimes I, I listen to it and I get, I get a little tired of it. I think symphony number five, um, the melodies really go places, um, especially the opening. It's it's quite the opening is um, 
the opening is very mysterious, I think, for that kind of like late romantic Russian music. Um, this is probably my favorite recording of the piece. This is um, the Leningrad Phil with uh, Evgeny Mavrinsky. And when these came out in the late 60s, it was kind of a shock to um, the classical music world because I don't think no one had ever heard this music played this fast, this cleanly. Um, some of the tempos on this, especially in the Symphony No. 4 version, are um, s still quick by today's standards, um, which is saying something. And also, I think nobody is really expecting a Soviet orchestra to play so well, um, because there are some very, very, very mediocre to poor uh, Soviet recordings from the 50s and 60s um, from the same era that you can go and listen to. But um, Mavrinsky and the Leningrad Phil were a very good match together. He raised the standards of that orchestra substantially. Um, And these recordings that Deutsche Grammophon did in the 60s of this Tchaikovsky cycle are outstanding. Um, this is not an original. This is a Speaker's Corner reissue um, that's very, very good from the original analog tapes. There's also a excellent um, Deutsche Grammophon uh, all-analog box set reissue of Symphony 4, 5, and 6 with Leningrad that you can pick up now. That was also done all analog, and it sounds very, very good. Um, so either of these pressings you can't really go wrong with. I think... Um, they're probably better than the original. Original Deutsche Grammophon um, is not amazing sound quality, in my opinion. One of my favorite moments of this symphony, and the reason I put it on this list, is the beautiful parts that the oboe and French horn get together in the second movement. And then again, the oboe and the bassoon get together in the third movement. But the horn solos um, in this, I mean, this is definitely a horn player piece. Um, it's, I think, an excerpt for horn players. And then... Um, after a bit of horn exposition in the second movement, you get some wonderful, like, you know, the oboe, uh, oboe horn call and response, and the oboe plays harmony to the horn. Um, really, really lovely stuff, and um, I have fond memories of performing this at McGill. So, number 10 on this list, the last piece on this list, is another uh, piece that is fiendishly difficult, maybe not quite as difficult as the Bartok, but definitely up there, and that is Samuel Barber's uh, Piano Concerto. This is the first actual recording of this Piano Concerto, and I think it's one of the only ones from kind of the golden LP era, um, at least on major labels. Um, this is with John Browning and uh, George Zell and the Cleveland Orchestra on Columbia. Um, I think this is a two-eye pressing, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it came out after the six-eye label era was already done. The sound quality is okay. It's it's definitely not an audiophile recording. But again, this is one of the only big analog era recordings we have of this piece. It's incredibly difficult. The rhythms... Um, what's interesting about Barber is he writes these, in the slow movements, he writes these big, sweeping, romantic melodies that are just gorgeous. I mean, the second movement of this piece is so beautiful. Um, and then the exterior movements are incredibly frantic and uh, very uh, jazzy. Uh, Samuel Barber was, of course, an American composer, and he took a lot of influence from the Gershwin style of composition and also, you know, the vernacular music, uh, black vernacular music, jazz, things like that. Um, so Barber's music is always interesting, but it's always really difficult. Um, I've never played an easy Barber piece. But I think the Piano Concerto is, is my favorite work of his, and it's worth it alone just for the second movement. I've played this twice, however, I've only performed it once. Um, the first time I got handed this music, um, I've practiced it fiendishly because it was incredibly difficult, and then they actually um, ended up rotating a bunch of musicians, and I, I ended up not being the one to perform it, um, which I was a little upset about because I had put so much work into learning the music. And then, um, but I actually did get a chance to play it again later, uh, last summer at Aspen, actually. And even though I had prepared the music a year before, um, it was still a lot of work to work up, but very rewarding. An incredible piece that I think more people should listen to. I, in general, I think Barber is very well known in the United States and not well known elsewhere, even in Canada. Um, and I really think he's probably one of the best American composers we ever had. Um, so I think, uh, Definitely his music, his symphonies, and his concertos are worth um, more consideration in the rest of the world. I, I definitely am uh, an exponent of uh, Barber's music. So that was it. That was um, 
my 10 favorite orchestral pieces that I've ever played and my favorite recordings of those pieces. So um, for all my musicians in the VC out there, what are some orchestral pieces that you played that were favorites of yours? Um, have you guys heard any of these recordings? Have you played any of these pieces I mentioned? If so, let me know down in the comments and uh, I will see you all in the next video. Cheers.